Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sunkara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. My guest today is Manan Mehta, the founding partner of Unshackle Ventures, a firm that he launched after he had to shut down his own startup because one of the co-founders did not have the immigration status to work in the U.S. He realized that immigration was a problem that not only affected him, even though he is a U.S. citizen, but affects thousands of founders who want to launch a startup. Prior to Unshackle, Manan ran the marketing for EdTech startup No, which raised over $90 million and was later acquired by Intel. I've known Manan for a long time now, and he's been true to his firm's mission of connecting the unconnected and supporting the startups with capital and customers. Immigration is a topic very dear to my own heart because I struggle with it. And so do a number of deep tech researchers who are trying to launch startups. We need immigration reform to help such aspiring founders. But until then, we need firms like Unshackle to continue to help founders to focus on the startup while they take care of the immigration issues. In this episode, we will talk about the thesis behind funding immigrant entrepreneurs, more specifically about their process for funding startups and how they help them with the visa issues. We will also discuss sectors they invest in and finally about Unshackled University Fellowship Program and Roundtable Program, a secret program they're running that you might be interested in. Welcome to the show, Manan. I've been looking forward to talking to you about Unshackled on my show because of the way your firm helps immigrant entrepreneurs. Let's start with the basics. What is Unshackled Ventures? It's great to be here, Naresh. I appreciate you doing what you're doing. It's also a lot of fun to focus more of our attention on postdocs and students and what they're trying to build. Unshackled at the 10,000 foot level is a early stage venture fund for immigrant led companies. So going back kind of into the history of Unshackled, both my co-founder and I were attempting to start businesses. And I, as an American citizen, was working with a visa holding co-founder on an H-1B. And Nithin, my now co-founder, was starting another company with a visa holding founder. And what we saw very quickly was that immigration was slowing us both down individually, meaning we were able to go full-time, but our co-founders couldn't. They were shackled to their employers who were sponsoring their visas. And Unshackled really was a product of our own experiences dealing with some of the unnatural challenges of building a company and our desire to solve those. And so really basic, what we do is three things. We write high conviction first investment checks into companies, very similar to friends and family capital. So think about one of the benefits a lot of native born entrepreneurs have is maybe access to 25, 50, 100K of family money. Maybe not, but many cases in the Bay Area, you see it. Immigrants don't always have that. And so we want to be that source of capital at the exact same stage. The second thing we do is provide full immigration support, including visa sponsorship. So we've sponsored 170 immigration filings now over the past six and a half years with 100% success and giving our entrepreneurs that we're backing a chance to work full-time without worrying about their work authorization or their ultimate pathway to permanent residency or their green card. And the third thing that we do is kind of a tip of our cap in recognition to what makes Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, is how do you help people meet the right people? Because the difference between success and failure is not what you know, it's who you know and when. And so if you are somebody who is part of an immigrant-led team, chances are that person only has five to seven years at most in the U.S. 
And so our job as a fund is to connect the unconnected. And so wrapping that all up, what we are is effectively a high conviction friends and family investor that removes immigration hurdles and gives you a network to help you succeed faster. Fantastic. That's great what you're doing because people at the PhD at the postdoc level who are trying to start companies, a majority of them are international and immigration is a huge issue. Can you walk us through a typical process? Like say I come to you, I want to start a company. What does that look like from the time I reach you and say like, hey, I want to start a company to you funding me? First of all, our whole process tries to be blind to your immigration status because we think it's more important to invest in the person than look for convenience on what's the easiest immigration pathway to solve. Second, it also starts with a form on our website. So we are blind to source of intro. We are really, really mindful. We need to provide equal access to both cold and warm intros. And so everything in our process is designed such that it's truly equitable to anybody that wants to get funded by Unshackled both from a source of intro as well as immigration. So what happens then? Let's say we do get a form. Really, our process is quite simple. It typically has three meetings, a total of three hours to an investment decision. The thing that we are really mindful of is that a founder's time is superiorly more important than ours. And we have to meet them where they are, not have them meet us where we are. And so what that looks like in more specificity is that we have these people fill out these forms, entrepreneurs fill out forms. We look at it every week. Our team evaluates and gets a response within seven days to the founder that fill out the form. And then we invite them for pitches on Tuesday and Wednesday mornings for those that we want to learn more about. Typically about 25% or so are invited to pitch. And that's based on the form, their deck, and their story. Those pitches are on average 30 minutes long. And we're simply looking for them to answer three basic questions. Why you? Why this? Why now? We are very, very focused on founder problem fit, not on product market fit, not on go-to-market fit, because so many of our companies haven't even been incorporated yet. So they can't have any product, nor revenue. If we like what we hear and we find some alignment on the insights that are provided in that first pitch, you're then invited to a second meeting. This is typically a 40-minute meeting. We invite one other partner. So on the very first pitch, there's a partner and associate. On the next pitch, that same partner and associate stays on it, and we invite our second partner. In between, we are doing our own third-party research. We're talking to industry experts. We're doing our own third-party research. We're getting smart. If that goes well, that's where we'll talk a little more about how do you constrain the problem? How are you identifying your customer? What sort of validation have you done? to support this thesis. If that goes well, the final meeting is a 60 minute where we now have that same associate, that very first partner, the second partner, and now our third partner joins. We are a consensus driven firm. So what's happening throughout the time is you have one partner remain consistent throughout. We're building on the conversation and we're also showing you our entire team. That is the bench that will be behind you if we are investing. We think it's really important that founders pick their VCs as well, and they should know if we are to invest, who is going to be in their corner to help them succeed faster. So while that looks like a long process, that can be done in three weeks. It can be done in two weeks. It can be done in one week. In the very first meeting, we tell a founder, if your process is moving faster, let us know. We will meet you there. What do you mean by that? If they are talking to other investors and things are moving faster, we will not let our process dictate our outcome. Uh, That's phenomenal. (laughs) Not many people do that, I believe. But this is a great process. Yeah. It's really important, again, for us to be aware that customer service is one of the most principal elements of what we do in venture capital. And that customer service starts with the very first interaction you have with Unshackle. Whether we invest in you or not, I mean, the numbers would suggest we're probably not going to invest in you because every year we see about 1,800 investment opportunities. We're investing in 15 to 18 of them. So it's a pretty high probability we are probably not going to invest in someone that fills out the form. But that doesn't mean we need to treat those people as if they don't become portfolio founders because immigrants need support and they need feedback and we do our best part to provide that. So many threats I want to go after. 
let's start with first, like how much time does it typically take before you let them know the decision? I'll give you real timelines. We take pitches, first pitches, which is with one associate, one partner on a Tuesday or Wednesday. By that Friday, we'll let you know if you're invited to the next or not. And the reason is, is on Thursday afternoons, we have a full team meeting and we discuss every deal that we talked to that week. The next one, the next pitch, let's say we schedule it on a Friday morning, a Wednesday afternoon, that following Monday, the partners group together and we'll notify you by Monday night or Tuesday. If you make it to the final step, chances are if there's a decision being made, we'll call you that same day. If there's more questions, you'll get an email the following day. If it's a decision to pass, we'll also call you and let you know why we're not investing. That typically happens within 48 to 72 hours. Wow, that's a pretty fast pace, actually. The reason is, is that partnership meets twice a week. Ah. Mondays and Thursdays. And you take cold calls and cold emails. Application, basically. That's how you, you can be reached. That's how you get to us. And again, you can be referred to us by a portfolio founder, by a limited partner, by Elon Musk. It doesn't matter. You're going to have to go through that form. Nice, nice. It's nice to have that uniform be and you'll be treated equally by the firm. You mentioned about doing your due diligence with industry partners. Can you elaborate on that? Like what goes on in that process? Give an example. It'll be easier. This is really hard to do at the pre-seed stage, candidly, because what we're looking for is founders that are trying to shape the future of that industry. So let's take, for example, we made a recent investment in the brain-computer interface segment. These are PhDs out of Oxford and Cambridge. And certainly... We know there's been a lot of interest scientifically in trying to understand how the brain can power interaction design, can power decisions, can power activities and motor skills. The connection has been hard to measure. And so in this example, we were much more interested in understanding why things had not worked before than why it would work in the future. One thing that I've learned very quickly in this pre-seed investment stage is that when you ask people to believe something will work, they're very skeptical. By nature, if you've never seen it work, you don't think it can work. And so if you are a PhD that believes something can work, you need to know much rather why it won't work. And so one of the things that we learned in our third-party research and talking to people who understood some of this was this was a material substrate challenge. As a wearable, you have to find a place that you can have active mobility to then translate that into high-performance sports, for example. It's one thing to have the measurement of your electrical circuits when you're sitting down, but that's not the sports environment. It's something totally different if you're running on a soccer field or a pitch, but it won't stay on you. And so what we realized very quickly that this was a material substrate issue, and we knew why it could not work, and it turns out this team understood that. Their true innovation wasn't in how we process data necessarily, not yet, It was first to create a stickable, malleable material substrate that could allow the measurement of electrical signals in your brain. That is a great example of how we underwrite these investments is the founder's insight addressed a critical problem, but had we asked to an industry, do you think that the Manchester United would use a brain-computer interface and measure the athlete's performance under high stress and low stress environments. They'll say it's not possible. Rather, I rather ask is, why hasn't it worked in the past? What challenges do they face? That informs us what the next level innovation will be. And that's how we validate it. That's phenomenal. So basically, you're looking for some unique insights from the founders. And you had three questions. Why you? Why this? And why now? What stood out in that why you question? Like in the people who you funded and those who you didn't fund, what is special about who you? Yeah, it tends to be an obsession for a lot of our founders. I think it's really important to denote that entrepreneurs aren't just born in that moment. It tends to be a life journey. And it's the investor's job, specifically as the first investor in these companies, to learn about their lives up until that point. Why do they want to be entrepreneurs? Why do they want to potentially do one of the hardest things they're ever going to do? Most of these entrepreneurs are leaving jobs that are paying them very, very well. So it's not a financial motivation necessarily. And to leave that comfort, there has to be a bit of personal confidence that you can do this. And many of our founders that we talk to, because they're immigrants, tend to be very humble 
and not sharing what they had to grow up through, what their parents were doing, always small business owners. They were running corner shops or they were forced to start working at 10 years old. They don't tell you these stories unless you know to ask them. And when you start to connect that, you start to see a bit of a through line on if this line were to continue, and let's call this line the line of growth, does our capital in this moment create exponential growth going forward? Or are they going to stay flattening out and go down? That's what we're trying to learn. Like, why you? Why now? Why this? Because our hope is that our capital changes the slope of that curve, which is already going up into the right, but accelerates it up faster. And that's the benefit of being a little bit older for most people, right? It's being in your 20s or 30s. What you want to do at 16, you probably couldn't do it because you didn't know as much. But now you might be 26 now. But if I understood what started them at 16, and it may be in something totally different, different industry, it could have been, hey, I was selling textbooks at college, for example, and now I'm a PhD in brain computer interface. Like, that's fine. But the art of building a business started much earlier in your life. And so those are the things that we're looking for in the story to fully appreciate that this person has this, what we call adversity muscle to deal with the next, hopefully 10 years, at least. You bring up an important point about these entrepreneurs being very humble. They don't tell the whole story. We hear stories in the US all the time about how they're the first generation. The other question was, when you're talking to the industry partners, this is fascinating for me because when you try to get feedback from incumbents, they might not have that insight about what that future is going to look like that the entrepreneur is bringing to you. Stick to that point and say like, whether things where you go to 10 different companies and say like, hey, what do you think of this technology? And everybody says no. And you decide that this person has something new and you invested. Were there examples of that kind? Countless. I can think about a company that just announced their Series A called Planable Foods, a $21.5 million financing round, which turns out to be the largest Series A in our portfolio to date. And we first invested in them about two and a half, three years ago in their pre-seed round. And so it's been a relatively short amount of time. And it's a really fascinating story in this context because one of the people that we went to has built a career around alternative proteins, built a career on having all the professors that are at UC Davis who understand this topic really well as advisors, as resources. Has a been an advisor to a lot of other companies. When we went to this person, it was the first person we went to, there was a lot of doubt that was casted on the ability for this team to extract enough protein concentrate from this leafy green product called Lemna. And the founders, none of which were PhDs or scientists. In fact, the CEO is a former trader. And so there's a lot of reason to doubt and be skeptical that this could happen. It turns out we invested because we saw enough of a robust framework around how do you iterate, how do you validate, and how do you ultimately test in the real market at a relatively low cost, that nine months or four months later, that person we went to invest. This has now become one of his biggest potential winners. Interesting. But the reason why it was possible is not so much because this person, industry expert, wasn't convinced necessarily. It was sometimes we recognize industry insiders because of their framework, just need to see more than everybody else because they know where all the skeletons are. If you were to give me an ed tech company, because I used to work on marketing for an education technology company, I have now appreciated, I have a very strong bias against why it won't work. That is something that all industry insiders have. Whether it's right or wrong, that's what makes them who they are. They had to rise by solving these problems and seeing which ones could not be solved. And so we always take that perspective with a grain of salt, but more so what we try to understand from them is, does this team have the ability to overcome that question? And if you can't do that in your pre-seed to seed, you're probably not going to raise your next round. So when you identify that key hurdle, why something won't work, it has to be the first problem you solve. Because if that person whose voice is so valuable doesn't see it solved, anyone else who's an investor will probably go back to that person and that problem will remain unanswered. Your company will probably never raise again. So that's what's really informative about 
what I think pre seed so great is that you get to learn very quickly why people don't think you're going to work, and then you solve that one first. Because if you do it, you can raise your seed round. It must be a very hard decision to make for you. There are a lot of non-believers, and there's something unique that you're looking for, and you go ahead and make the decisions. Were you wrong in any of your decisions? And like, is there anything that stands out common? In <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> is there one or two wrong. things that stand out? Just trying to understand your decision-making process. That's the reason. Yeah, look, we've made 61 investments. 49 of our companies remain active. So 12 companies have certainly not worked out the way the founders were hoping it to. And maybe there's more. To be very honest with you, I don't preoccupy myself with why it didn't work. In terms of lessons, yeah. If you yeah, walk away look, something. like the lessons that I have to learn are very different lessons that a founder has to learn. My lesson as a capital allocator should stay constrained to a capital allocation decision. I should not be passing off my perspective on plant-based proteins while I'm also investing in space technology, while I'm also investing in fintech products. Who am I to pass judgment on those industries when I'm not in any one of those three? And I wasn't the founder. So my framework of decision-making is always going to come back to, did we put good money after bad? Do we not do our diligence properly? What do we have to learn how to ask better questions? That's all that I should be extracting from things that don't work. Anything that goes at a macro level or industry level is a fool's move in venture capital. Because in any given moment, you can have one company that could be the home run and the other company, the exact same company, somehow be nothing. You don't know. And the moment you start to castigate doubt on an industry or a strategy or a vertical, you've written off a whole part of your investment capability. That's very true. I'm learning. So this is the learning process for me. Thank you for educating on that. Like other areas or sectors, you mentioned a bunch of them that you stick like to invest money in. Yeah, look, we're an agnostic fund. So I mentioned plant-based, brain computer. I mentioned fintech. We've done creator economy. We've done social commerce. We have a photo sharing app. The point I'm making is that we are very, very much driven by the impact the founders want to make and their ability to communicate effectively why they are the best ones to do that. As it relates to things that we get excited about, certainly there's things that are bubbling up personally in our lives that Maria, our youngest partner, she's in her late 20s. Nathan, my co-founder, the oldest partner is in his early 40s and I'm in my late 30s. We all have very different life experiences going on personally. Nathan's got two kids that are almost teenagers. I have a one-year-old and Maria's about to get married next year. We recognize that those life experiences outside of work are shaping what we all care about. Like for me, I'm caring a lot more about diet and food and climate right now because I have a very young daughter and I'm like, hey, I'm seeing these fires. I'm seeing some of these climate issues. I want to see us be part of the future that gives my daughter a better life. Nathan's got a son that's 10, a daughter that's 12. He's thinking about how do I get them active? What kind of education are they getting? It's not just that he doesn't care about the future. His focus is very different right now. And Maria is much more younger. So Of course, she's dealing with all the operational challenges of planning a wedding, working remote. There are things that just naturally infuse our current views. And I think that's what makes it so much fun that we have really three partners that are in very different life experiences right now. So we get to be agnostic intelligently. And then we rely upon Sarah and Amani on our team, both in their mid-20s or young 20s. And that informs a very different view of what consumer expectations are. I find us to be uniquely excited about very different topics. And what's really powerful is that we share all these excitements, we share all these experiences, and all of a sudden we're all becoming wiser. And so all of a sudden, the entire bench of Unshackled to a portfolio founder is all the more valuable. Let's slightly shift the gears into immigration. A lot of the audience that listen to podcasts, this podcast are going to be like grant students and postdocs if they are having a visa issue. How do you deal with them? If they come to you with a PhD, what is the typical process, like one or two routes that you drive them and who takes care of the immigration? Do the students still have to take care of that or do you handle that? The investment process is no different than what I discussed earlier in this podcast. The three steps, same decision. Immigration doesn't creep into that conversation. We understand what it is, but we're not making a decision based on that. And so when it comes to immigration, as I said earlier, we did 170 immigration filings. To be clear, that is across 13 different immigration visa categories. Wow. Everything from OPT extensions, which some F1 students may require, 
all the way to EB1s and national interest waivers to green cards. There's two questions we ask. Number one, what's the fastest pathway to get to work? Number two, what's the fastest pathway to get to work for as long as you want? Because most visas are temporary in some nature, right? They're three years, six years, two years. It all depends on category. And so when it comes to a postdoc or a PhD, I think the better question is recognizing what their education level is, the country of birth matters, what sort of IP they've generated, is it a treaty nation or not, starts to inform a lot more of the answers. And to be clear, Unshackle does all this at no cost to the founders. So all legal costs are borne by our investment. It doesn't come out of the investment. It's borne by the fund. We have two immigration partners that do all this work, but have also done a lot of work across universities, Sorati Law Firm, and they do 100% of our filings. We pay for all the costs of work authors into green card for the founders. So work off to green card. So whether it's someone that goes from an H-1B lottery to an extension, to an O-1, to an EB-1, that could cost you 40, 50, 70, maybe 100 grand, depends on the number of RFEs you get along the way. Zero of those dollars will be borne by the founders. Wow, that is fascinating. I think just this should be like music to everybody who's thinking about it, the opportunity and the cost and somebody else handling your immigration problems. I think they can just focus on the work they're supposed to be doing. Like This is a little bit crass, but I'll say it anyways. Being a venture capitalist and being a capitalist by nature, me solving your immigration creates no added value to your business, but it allows you to get to work. And that's my job is customer service. So I am trying to remove every obstacle that gets in your way from actually creating more value for me. <laughs> that is fundamental. Like I'm an immigrant. Like, I came to this country on a student visa and it needs to be solved. Like such an obvious problem. Like I haven't seen too many VC firms boasting about this. I don't know if they actually take on this as an initiative at their firms. Like why hasn't this caught up? Like everybody talks about how there are so many immigrant entrepreneurs, successful ones. Why is it not catching up? And then what caught your attention like that you had to take on this? To the latter point, certainly personal experience, as I laid out earlier, when I had to shut a company down because my co-founder was an H-1B visa holder and we weren't moving fast enough, was the impetus for me to talk to Nitin and Nitin had an idea and we started working on it. So it became very personal because I was blind to immigration for the first 33 years of my life. I was a son of immigrant. I understood the immigrant journey. I didn't appreciate the immigration journey and they are unique. They're different. And so to your former question around other VCs, other needs, I think this is one of those situations where we just saw an opportunity. What we saw was if you went to co-working spaces or to entrepreneurship centers on campuses, typically after school hours or work hours, you would see a commonality or a non-trivial percentage of the population there speaking other languages, eating ethnic cuisine, or having kind of a story from somewhere else. That just became very obvious to us. And we realized the commonality amongst them were many of them were visa holders. Could be a student visa, could be a work visa. And when you think about innovation, a couple of things need to happen. Number one, you have to identify a problem with solving. And number two, it has to make economic sense. A lot of the early stage VCs for a long time have established their credibility and they are writing much larger checks. And so by virtue of what the industry has shown in the last 10 years is that there's been a lot of friends and family that have entered the market and angel investors that entered the market that have made funds wait a little bit longer or write much bigger checks. That left out this population who didn't want to raise all that money and couldn't and hadn't yet incorporated either. And when you realize that friends and family and angels couldn't create a structure like this. You needed a firm that had an institutional backing to actually sponsor these visas to get to 100% of the immigrant entrepreneurship community. That's why we exist. It's because no one really could do it. And now we have seven years of operating history with our governments, three different administrations. I think it gives us a bit of an advantage on being very thoughtful. To be very clear, I would love nothing more for there to be an entrepreneurship visa. You and me. I would love the 170 filings going forward to be one visa category. It'd be amazing. Amen. I think there's more immigrant talent that we've not served, that we can never serve, that I wish more people could do what we do. So what others see as a problem in immigration you saw as an opportunity and the need to help them. That's great. And how big are your checks? We never talked about that. Right now we're writing checks between a quarter million and 400K. And how much equity do you take typically? 
it ranges. I mean, it can be on the low end of 6% and on the high end about 12%. Nice. Not bad at all. Talk about your fund. Like who invested in your fund and how big is it right now? We're currently investing out of a $20 million vehicle. We manage overall about 30 million with our first fund, as well as some specific investments we've done in companies. Our LPs are comprised of some recognizable names across tech. The most notable publicly available name is Emerson Collective. That's led by Lorene Powell Jobs, who has certainly made her mark in a lot of things around tech and the future of our planet and our world. And then we have a lot of HNIs and high net individuals and family offices, many of which give us that third vector, which is how do you connect the unconnected? Nice. I hear a lot of the VC firms are about the network they bring to the table that can support the entrepreneurs. Can you speak to that kind of network you built over the years? There's two real easy ways of measuring this for us at our stage. Does our network help you with customers or capital? Talent can become important, but typically not when we are the only investor. Talent becomes more important at seed or series A. And then the other funds have better skill sets there. But can we help you get customers and or capital, whether it could be a design partner, could be your first paying customer, your pilot customers. So we spend a lot of our time focusing on that. And I'll give you one anecdote and then some raw data. The first anecdote is one of our companies. We hosted what we call a founder series where industry CEOs, privately held companies in most cases, will do these really behind the scenes, closed door meetings with a handful of founders in their industry or understand their industry and kind of give them the insider scoop on what to do and what not to do and how to raise capital and, and whatnot. It turned out that there was a really strong match. And six months later, we found out that one of our portfolio companies signed a two-year, $5 million deal with that. And at that point, they had raised a fraction of that total. And so what you see happen is just through the connection of networks, this incredible opportunity to build a company. Certainly after the company signed that, they raised a lot more money more momentum, more customers, more people come to the revolving door, it becomes a much easier filter. The second one is more of raw data. Certainly venture is power laws and it's one company results in most of your returns. But let me be clear very upfront here. Unshackled's highest value portfolio company is a quarter billion dollars, not a single unicorn. Collectively, the portfolio companies are worth $1.5 billion today. So either we have a lot of companies doing really well (laughs) or something is weirdly happening that I have not yet discussed. And the way to measure how that's happened is for every dollar we've invested, our companies have raised 27 times more on average. It's not a metric that a lot of funds will talk about because it doesn't matter to them. Because the moment SoftBank invests in your company, it's kind of hard to make sense of this on averages. But that's why I, I play disclaimer up front. There's not a single unicorn. And remember what I said earlier, 49 of the 61 companies remain active. That's phenomenal. And 27X is like metric should boast about all the places. <laughs> this is a simple fact of our job is to connect the unconnected. And we know that customers and capital are the two most important things for somebody that doesn't have that network. And so, yeah, we can make an investment, write that first three to 400K check. We can solve your immigration, but then what? You have 10 more years at least ahead of you. And that's where we focus our efforts on. And I think that's what's showing that you can have a much more horizontal impact by being an expert or trying to become an expert at the stage of investing, as opposed to a vertical within the stage of investing for us. Speaking of the stage of investment, when these founders are coming, they're mostly in the idea stage. And there's so much talk about the product market fit. And especially in the deep tech space, According to me, at least, I believe, can you build a product is a much bigger question, like a drug, like a diagnostic is a much bigger question than product market fit. And what is your take, your firm's take on the product market fit? And when do you actually really look into that? At what stage? We're really lucky here. As a pre-seed investor, we don't have to be constrained by that question. Really what we're asking, and if you think about this as pre-seed is your founder problem fit, Seed is your problem market fit. Series A is your product market fit. And then beyond that, it's go-to market fit. We think about that paradigm 
much more than we think about valuation, round sizes, and all that, right? Those are all outputs of companies' progress. So when we look at what we have to invest in is, can we help this founder navigate founder problem fit to product problem fit? Now, that set of investors should start to think about go-to market fit or product market fit, more likely. At that point, we are bringing in other people. They're probably raising a lot more capital. They have more time to do risk. They're hiring more talent. We have to think about this in a very much of a stage fashion, but that doesn't mean as a company evolves that we don't help at every single step. We become kind of that horizontal platform, but our solution is very verticalized, but we become ubiquitous across all stages of the company so we can be helpful. And that's what's allowed us to ultimately be, so far, reasonably successful in helping companies get from pre-seed to seed. I haven't heard anybody else put this so elegantly. Pre-seed, seed state, so found a problem fit. Yes, it goes <laughs> on to product problem fit, and then comes a product market fit. I'm going to write this, write an article on this one. <laughs> I'm going to steal this, but I'll give the credit to you. Yes. <laughs> Please. When you have investors, they expect returns. And deep tech startups generally tend to take much longer time than a software company per se. How do you balance this act? Like if a diagnostic or a therapeutic company comes to you and says like, it's going to take about 10 years or more for that matter. How do you balance your portfolio? I don't empirically believe it takes longer. Talk to me more about this. <laughs> If we go back to the framework we just talked about, some of those stages may take longer, but others may be compressed. So if you are doing a therapeutics, there are meaningful milestones that de-risk the company. And it de-risk the company in such a magnificent way in year seven, it's the equivalent of getting to $100 million in ARR for a software company. And that probably takes seven years too. So you may be going through all your clinical trials, getting through phase one, two, and three, and maybe getting FDA approval at some point. Yeah, it may take you 10 years, But if I'm being honest, if you get that approval, you're a multi-billion dollar company in most cases. Most software companies outside of a few and far between, like I know the media makes it sound like everyone's coming to be billionaire, billion dollar companies. Most take as long to go from when the founder truly thought of the problem the first time and started working on it. All the databases, whether it be PitchBook, Crunchbase, you name it, they don't account for that pre-incorporation to first finding round timeline. That typically is two or three years. When Unshackled is investing, that timeline is now becoming noticeable. And so we are extremely patient, fully expecting that the asthmatotic rise may not be in year three. It may be your year in eight. But at that point, how are you comparable to something that historically was faster? Like we just saw Solution announce a $350 million round. When did they start? 15? Six years? $1.3 billion company? That feels pretty software-alike. Definitely nothing called overnight success in this space, though. Yeah, everything takes time. I want to talk to you about, like, were there any startups that came to you, you turned them down and say, like, hey, we will probably invest you if you hit these milestones? And were there cases where they came back and then you invested? Or is it mostly like you pass the opportunity mostly because it's not a fit for you guys? We've never invested in something that we said, hit these milestones and we'll invest. That goes against our very definition of what we do. We underwrite people not businesses. And so have we invested in people that we passed on because they went back and did more customer discovery and pivoted? Absolutely. But I have never set forth a milestone, said, hey, hit X dollars. It doesn't make any sense for pre-seed. It doesn't make sense for our thesis. And so it's much more around, can you do more customer discovery around this? And if the problem changes a little bit or the solution changes, I'll underwrite that all day long but I'm not going to underwrite your business traction because at that point, A, there are more investors for you. B, I have to accept I missed the opportunity because it doesn't make sense portfolio-wise. I can't get the economics that I want to return my fund. Or three, if that were to ever happen, the only thing I can see working was if they gave us a small slug of their next round and they really want us on their cap table and we thought that was a good fit. We've never done it. Let's shift gears into a couple of programs that you run, the Unshackled Ventures University Fellowship Program. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, so the University Fellowship was really a product of us wanting to bet on the next generation and always be a part of the generation. Unshackled wants to be a generational fund, and that that will only mean that the founding partners will get older, and that's going to make us less connected the older we get. So this is a tip of the cap that 
our generation's Ellis Island is our university system. So 70% of the postdocs at UC Berkeley are using Berkeley as their Ellis Island, their port of entry in a lot of ways. So how do we make sure we're there where they are? And what I said earlier, we meet founders where they are. And number two, it was our opportunity to also demystify some of the investment process. And so we actually, the university fellows at Unshackled, we have about 50 plus across the board, across three programs right now. But these fellows are helping us do industry deep dives. They're on pitches. They're giving us their opinions on what to invest. That BCI company that I mentioned, a fellow did the first deep dive, gave us some informed questions, joined us on a call, changed his mind completely when he heard the solution. And that mattered to us because technically he knew a lot more about it than we did. How does one become a venture fellow at your firm? Apply. It's available on our website or on our Medium blog post. We're doing Venture Fellowship 4.0 right now. It's available to all campuses across the country. So all 8,000 universities or whatever it is now. And we go through a selection process and onboard them. Nice. I'll make sure I have a plugin on the website for the podcast. Thank you. Do you still run the EIR program? Yeah. So that program has evolved to something called more the roundtable program. And specifically describing the roundtable program, we've done a few of them so far, but this is a confidential program that is effectively teaching immigrant entrepreneurs how to start a company while on a visa. So a lot of these people cannot be named. They're working somewhere else. They're doing this in their personal time and they're ideating. They're thinking through ideas. We made our very first investment out of it recently, about six months ago, a former Google engineer. Now I can say former. And these programs are really designed to obviously teach you how to start a company on a visa, but what does it look like to find a co-founder? What does it look like to do product validation and market validation, customer discovery, and then ultimately raise your first round? We ask for nothing in return. There's nothing. We do all the programming. We get you to meet people. We create the Slack group. We create the community for you. And we're very bullish on giving these potential entrepreneurs the playbook on how to start their company. A nominal program. I'm going to call you and talk to you more about the roundtable program. And is that an application process? How do people approach you for that? We don't have one open right now, but the team is working on the design of the next iteration, but hopefully soon. Nice. I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but thank you for being very patient. And what drives you? Like, what is the best part of being Manan Mehta? at Unshackle, and what is the hardest part? The best part is being able to work with people that are shaping the future. I think it's something really trite that a lot of people say, and I know it sounds trite when I say it too, but if you can't be the one to build it, be the one that invests in those who build it. I got to do that. I got to do it. I'm very fortunate. I know what I'm building. I can build that, but I can't build these next companies that are going to change the world in some way. And so the learning that I get Selfishly is, I've never gotten this much knowledge in such a short amount of time in my career. So that part is certainly very exciting. As it relates to the hardest part is when I realize that while I may have 61 portfolio companies, the founder has one. And when that founder struggles, that is hard. This is someone's life. 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 And so when things don't work, when things get hard, it's hard for the company. And there's humans. These are people. Everyone wants to say company names, but company names don't exist without the people behind the company. So there's a lot that goes on to building a company. And for a founder, oftentimes it's the first time they're going through it. For us now, because we've been doing it for seven years, we may have seen it before. So it's hard to watch those founders go through it on the first time on their own. So we try to step up and be there for them. But it's just hard to watch it because it's, at the end of the day, it's terrible breakups and failures for founders. Great point. And- I'm on the same board with you. One of the biggest reasons I do this podcast is it's a phenomenal way to learn so much by talking to the best like yourself. I enjoy this. Any last plugins from Unshackled Pro for the audience? Where can they meet you? Where can they talk to you? Yeah, I mean, look, I think I'm truly, truly honest when I say we respond to every cold email, every cold pitch. That's our front door. We want to have the widest front door possible. And it allows us to overcome biases, prejudices, and other pattern matches that fail. And so if you're interested in starting a company, nothing is too early. When we say day zero, we really mean before you incorporate your business. And we're happy to underwrite you, even through three ideas. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been great. I'm pretty sure the audience is going to learn a lot from you and I'm hoping that there'll be a lot more applications, but thank you for your time. Really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com.